Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're going to go ahead and proceed as people trickle in. Uh, we'll get them caught up. Um, welcome to 2010 Standards for Accessible Design. This is Fred Garcia from the Department of Administrative Services Office of, uh, OD, of DEI, and I'll be moderating uh, this afternoon's session. Very excited to support the commitment to inclusion uh, that Ohio has. Just a, a couple of quick announcements before we begin. First, we invite you to submit your questions or comments in the meeting chat. The presenter, Robin, she will do her best at the end to address everyone uh, of those questions if time allows. Second, the session will be recorded and may be posted online or made available for on-demand access. 2010 Standards for Accessible Design will be presented by Robin A. Jones from the Great Lakes ADA Center. Robin is the Principal Investigator and Project Director of the Great Lakes ADA Center, which is a member of the ADA National Network located within the Department of Disability and Human Development at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, please welcome Robin Jones. As in, uh, introduced, my name is Robin Jones. I am a 60 plus um, white female with um, short hair. Uh, my hair has got violet coloring in it. I wear black rimmed glasses. I have a blue denim jacket on today and I'm sitting in my office. And uh, I use the uh, pronouns of she and her. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to talk with you today on uh, accessibility and the 2010 ADA standards for accessibility. I'm going to run through these and then hopefully have some time for questions. Um, I know that the time is short and I've reduced it by now. So just so we all are on the same page, the Department of Justice issued rules. Um, the original ADA standards came out in 1991 when the ADA standards um, came out overall for um, the regulations for the ADA. They've been updated once in 2010 and they apply to Title II as well as Title III organizations. So state and local government, such as the state of Ohio, as well as places of public accommodation and commercial facilities as well. Um, there is also existing facilities, those that um, existed prior to the ADA, which would date us back all the way to 1990, and then also the compliance date for the revisions, which were um, came into effect in 2010. So, the, so basically now the date that we use for compliance with the ADA is March 15th of 2012. So anything that was before that would have been either in, needed to be in compliance with the 1991 standards, um, um, or if they were never modified, ne never, um, I didn't touch them, I didn't modify them, I didn't renovate them, whatever, you would have to bring them up to the 2010 standards. So I know that gets confusing um, and we get a lot of questions about that particular um, issue as like what applies when. So what I always do is I say I, I start with the analysis of when was the building built and then I once I've decided when the building's built I look at what standards would if there were any in place at that time and then my next question is when were there any renovations that were done to that building because that's going to also then tell me whether or not the ADA had any applicability um, with the 1991 standards or the 2010 standards. So it's kind of that, that line in the sand that we've basically drawn with the ADA's passage that we then look at from there on forward, what has been done with that building to look at what actually applies. And then of course, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the fact that you have state code um, in Ohio. Uh, state of Ohio utilizes the international building code with some Ohio-isms with it. Um, the international building code is a model code. Um, and the ADA and the uh, International Building Code really do closely um, work together and, and, and mash together. The difference is, is that the International Building Code is constantly being updated. Um, your state, um, you know, adopts uh, whatever version of the International Building Code that they currently want to um, be following. Um, whereas the ADA standards, they're um, done very infrequently. So we have the original from 1991 and then we have the 2010. We don't have anything more frequent than, than 2010 for the ADA standards, whereas the International Building Code has um, versions all the way up to 2022. So it is still um, uh, confusing and, and it's still important that when we're looking at whether we're in compliance, that we look at the concept of whether or not what we're following, what applies, what applies when, and making sure that we're using the more stringent standard because under the ADA, what applies is the more stringent standard. So if a state code is more stringent than the ADA, it would apply um, versus the um, 
the, the ADA. I'll give you an example. In, in my state, I'm in Illinois, our parking regulations in Illinois are more stringent than the ADA. Um, we have to have larger spaces, et cetera. Um, so when I talk to somebody in Illinois about um, accessibility and parking, I have to refer only to the Illinois code. I can't refer to the state code, uh, the ADA, because it, they would be um, uh, in error or they would be uh, non-compliant. Also, the other thing I'd like to stress is that the ADA standards are the minimum. They are the floor. That's the minimum requirement that you have to meet. You always can go above that. An example I would give of that, under the ADA, a ramp um, is a, for every one inch of rise, I have to have 12 inches of length. So if I have a three inch step, I have to have 36 inches of length in order to make that a compliant ramp. Now that's a one in 12 ramp. Um, that however is still, that's compliant. That meets the ADA compliance requirements, but we don't necessarily think that that is an, a, a very accessible um, ramp because a one in 12 ramp is still pretty steep. So we would really advocate beyond that for entities to say, hey, can you do a one in 15, which means for every one in inch, you're gonna have it be 15 inches in length. The longer I make the length, the more gradual the incline is of the ramp. So we really um, uh, encourage entities to look to go beyond the ADA standards and really only look at the ADA standards as the minimum and really look at your users, your applicability and what you have uh, um, able to do. The other thing that is problematic that we see working with the ADA standards is that entities often do things to the to the maximums or the minimums, and um, that's uh, problematic as well. So, for example, a reach range under the ADA is um, uh, 15 inches minimum to the from the floor to 48 inches maximum from the floor. So you have that whole space in between. So for like mounting a light switch or um, a control like to uh, for a, a air conditioner or something of that nature, um, or a swipe card um, type of a thing that you would do or a, a, a door um, push for a automatic door. Any of those kinds of things have to be mounted within that 15 inches off of the floor to 48 inches off of the floor in, in between that 15 and 48. What often we see happens, though, is entities mount at that 48 inches. And even at 48 inches, you have a large sector of people. While it's compliant, you have a large sector of people who are still going to have a problem reaching that 48 inches of height. So we really, again, recommend you look at um, who is your audience, what, are you, what is the control, how would people use it, and look at mounting it at a, a height that would serve most people. It's going to be impossible to do something that's going to serve everybody, but you could look at what you could serve the majority of people and look at heights being lower than that. So looking at a height of 36 inches instead of 48 inches for mounting a um, uh, 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 control for an automatic door, as an example. Now, there's going to be circumstances and situations where you may want to limit um, the um, uh, a control, like in a, a school or something like that, where you've got children um, and you don't want them to be playing around with the switches and stuff. So then you might think about because of the audience that's being served in that particular area, if children would have access to that area, you might think of a higher mounting um, for that particular reason. But again, you know, it needs to be thought through as to who's my user, um, what is the issue, and um, not always look at just minimums and maximums. There are some high, safe harbors under the ADA. Um, when the um, a, uh, ADA guidelines were passed in 1991, there were a lot of things that were not included, like playgrounds, fishing piers, amusement parks, and things of that nature. When they were added in the 2010 ADA standards, the ADA did not require you to go back and retrofit those things that were not previously part of the ADA standards. So they we call safe harbor. Um, so only those things that would be new construction or altered after March 15th that fall into those new areas like as I said, um, playgrounds, uh, swimming pools, um, golf courses, et cetera, um, would have to be um, uh, renovated so that they were accessible or constructed new so that they were accessible. But you weren't required to go back and retrofit. I'm going to talk about the standards themselves and some of the major areas of accessibility under the 2010 standards. First, let me also clarify who the 2010 ADA standards apply to. As I said earlier, they apply to Title II state and local government entities, and they apply to Title III places of public accommodation and commercial facilities. Who they don't apply to is they do not apply to private clubs, 
it's a very narrow definition um, under the IRS of a private club. It's a club that where the membership is voted on by the members. So it's not just a private club that it costs a lot of money to become a member of, but it's a private club where you get voted in to become a member, like a Masonic um, uh, entity or something. Some golf courses, um, uh, country clubs still have those kind of systems where you have to be vo voted in, um, be recommended to be a member. Those would fall outside of the ADA. Religiously controlled and operated entities are also not covered under the ADA. Um, they may be covered and they are covered under your state of um, Ohio um, code, though, for accessibility. And then um, Indian tribes, uh, those entities that have um, tribal uh, treaties with the United States um, would be exempted under the ADA. But again, state codes do not necessarily exempt um, uh, tribal entities. You have to look at that particular issue. And then the federal government is not covered by the ADA. The federal government is covered under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, and they have their own accessibility standards, um, which is the, the um, Architectural Barriers Act, which was actually passed in 1968. And that's what applies to post offices, court, uh, federal courthouses, federal correctional facilities, uh, military establishments, things of that nature. So it's really important and doing the analysis when you say, okay, what applies here is one who owns it and operates it. That's the first place to start. Um, and then um, looking at um, uh, what code uh, applies to them. So the ADA um, standards are broken down into 10 chapters um, and they all cover different areas and different um, uh, specialty scenarios. So the building blocks are things um, that are critical, like, you know, uh, 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 the reach ranges and clear floor space and such. Accessible routes includes things like um, uh, 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 ramps and elevators um, and stairways and things like that. Then you'll just general site and building elements itself um, is covered in chapter five. Plumbing elements like your um, bathrooms and things of that nature would be in six. Communication elements like signage or emergency alarm systems and such would be covered under seven. Special rooms and spaces would be things like um, uh, dormitories, uh, hotel rooms, things like that. Um, built-in elements, things that are um, built-in, like built-in seating um, and stuff would be under nine. And then 10 is recreational facilities, swimming pools and golf courses and things like that. So it's important that you understand the, the um, standards from that perspective. Also understand that the ADA standards are not a building code. Um, uh, uh, the ADA standards apply in the context of where you have an element. The ADA standards tell you how to make it accessible. The ADA never tells you what you have to have in a building. That's a building code. Building code tells you how many bathroom, how many toilet stalls you have to have based on your occupancy. A building code tells you how many fire exits that you have to have um, based on, you know, the local fire code. Um, the, a, a, a building code talks about, you know, how many, um, you know, amps of electricity you have to have for things or, or and such. So a building code is. Um, is different than an ADA. Building code is a, a health and safety kind of code um, for construction tolerances and for construction, um, uh, you know, uh, what is required to be had in a building. Again, the ADA standards are not a building code. They do not tell you what you have to have. They say, if you have it, this is how to make it accessible and this is what is required to be accessible if you have it. So there's nothing in the ADA that says you have to have a water fountain. It just says if you have a water fountain, this is what it has to look like for accessibility. The ADA doesn't say you have to have parking. It just says if you have parking, this is what parking has to look like. In fact, the ADA does not also say who gets to park in an accessible parking space. Uh, uh, the the um, your state code, your state motor vehicle code actually determines who gets to park in an accessible parking space. The ADA has nothing whatsoever to do with who qualifies to park in an accessible parking space. All the ADA has to do with parking is how many spaces do I have to have based on my occupancy and how big or what size the spaces are and what kind of signs I have to have on those spaces. Nothing else is in the ADA about parking itself. So um, the ADA does not say that you have to have an automatic door opener. It just says if you have an automatic door opener, this is how it has to operate. 
um, you know, we advocate for automatic door openers and automatic door openers can be a solution in situations where your door isn't accessible because you can't achieve the right amount of pound or force to open it or there are barriers um, to being, op being able to open it, there's not enough clear floor space in front of the door, then an automatic door becomes a viable option. We would promote um, automatic use of automatic doors as a universal design feature, but universal design is different than accessibility. Um, so, you know, again, you have to think and, and, and as you plan and you think about where does the state of Ohio want to be, I would strongly, strongly recommend and strongly advocate that the state of Ohio aims for universal design versus just compliance with the ADA standards or compliance with your state building code. Um, as I said, um, the ADA standards are state and local government, public accommodations, commercial facilities. The only exception is transportation facilities. They are covered by similar standards that are issued by the Department of Transportation back in 2006. So when I talk about what does a terminal look like, what does a bus station look like, what does a train station look like, what does a train track, what does a train platform look like, all of those things are um, done by the Department of Transportation under their standards. The ADA 2010 standards made some deviations from the 1991 standards in that in the past, the ADA had tried to create its own standards in some areas, and they had de determined that this is no longer really feasible or ethical because technology is changing so quickly, and there are other entities that do a better job at this. And so they actually reference external standards for some areas. So if I wanted to look at what is required for a powered door under the ADA, and again, I remind you, the ADA does not require a power door. It's only where a power door is provided. I have to meet these requirements. It refers to the ANSI requirements for um, power doors. And ANSI is American National Standards Institute. In the um, For elevators and lifts, it refers to ask me um, for those requirements for um, uh, that. And that's the uh, standards for mechanical engineering. Then egress. Um, for egress, it refers to the International Building Code for egress um, standards. For alarms, it uh, refers to the National um, Federation, I think, of Fire Protection, National Fire Protection um, uh, uh, Standards um, for fire alarms. And for play surfacing and play equipment, it refers to ASTM, which is a standard for um, this type of thing. And so, you know, the ADA does did not go out and create its own under these areas. It references these already existing standards because that makes for more consistency. And it also assures that when things get updated to the more current technologies and things that the, um, they're following suit um, with that because these are critical issues and they do it better than the access board. And it would be redundant um, or a waste of time for the access board to redo what's already been and done by other um, very reputable uh, standard setting organizations. So again, um, to, to locate, you would go, you know, what, if I want to look for and I want to find out where, to, where what is required of toilets, I'm going to go to the uh, table of contents and I'm going to look under plumbing elements in, in chapter six and such. So you would just make sure that you're using the table of contents. And I have to say that the U.S. Access Board has created some wonderful materials um, on their website to better explain the ADA 2010 standards. They have created guides um, to the 2010 ADA standards that break down all of the elements in um, uh, further from just the standards themselves and talks about um, why something is required, which I think makes a big difference. The other thing that they've done, which is wonderful, is they've created a series of animations that cover the various areas of the ADA standards so that you can actually see um, how something is applied in the standards. They're up to um, chapter seven with their um, animations. So they just released most recently in the last two weeks, their animation on signage. Um, and so what you actually get to see is how somebody with a disability navigates the space and how they use the signage requirements. So you can see and understand why a sign is required to be mounted 60 inches to the center line of the sign because you actually see somebody in a wheelchair and somebody who's in a, got a white cane and how they navigate the, the environment using 3D and on, on how that's important. Or in the toilet room um, uh, uh, animation, you actually see how somebody 
uh, does a transfer and why that clear floor space next to the toilet is so critical um, and why the clear floor space in front of a door is so critical for somebody to be able to have um, the ability to approach the door and open it and um, independently. So I really encourage you to explore that. And I've got links at the end of my presentation um, to these uh, websites and to this information, but I just want to note them at this point that they're um, excellent guides and excellent resources for um, understanding these things much better. So just going to start through the various elements um, and start with, you know, of course, you have to start with how do I get to someplace? Where do I start with my accessible route? Um, accessible routes under the ADA are required at sites of arrival. So if I have bus stops or I have uh, drop off zones or I have parking lots, um, they're required within the site. So if I have a site, and I have sidewalks that connect different features. If I have multiple buildings on a site and they have um, uh, walkways that connect them, those have to be accessible. Between stories in a building, such as elevators, and there are elevator exceptions I'll be talking about. I have to make sure that there is an accessible route in all spaces and elements. So if I have office areas, I have uh, 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 reception lobbies, you know, if, I, if I'm a museum and I have exhibits, all of those things, there have to be accessible routes through and to all of those elements. Um, there are specific requirements for accessible routes in restaurants, such as you think of the queues that you use when you go into a restaurant, whether you've gone to Wendy's or whatever, where you get in line to be able to order um, or cafeteria lines, um, self-service um, areas, things, uh, performance areas like um, being able to get onto a stage or anything of that nature. Press boxes, there's very specific requirements for press boxes employee work areas, and then also recreation and facilities. So there's a lot of specificity about um, accessible routes that might be different um, in specific spaces due to the nature of those types of spaces. So just to talk for a second about elevator exceptions, exceptions um, for the private sector, if it's less than three stories or less than 3,000 square feet, they're not required to have an elevator. However, for government entities, once you go over one story, um, you are required to have an elevator, um, except where you have an occupancy of less than five. So like if I am the, um, the you know, Ohio Department of Natural Resources and I have a boat traffic tower on the Ohio River um, and there's less than five people that are going to be in there, I would not be able to be required to do that. If I had a press box um, that was elevated and had occupancy of less than five people, I would not be required to do an elevator. So let's say um, if I was, um, you know, uh, uh, Ohio State University, which is a, a Title II entity, something of that nature. So there are a few exceptions, but they're very few and far between. Again, here's the, the, um, the uh, press boxes issue. All right. Um, just some clarifications. Access is not required if no pedestrian route is provided. So, for example, our office gets calls all the time from people who live in communities that don't have um, uh, <coughs> uh, sidewalks. And people with disabilities um, often find that their only option is to ride in the street. And then they get a ticket from the police because they're not allowed to ride in the street. No, no non-motorized vehicles and a wheelchair is not considered a motorized vehicle. It's a pedestrian um, uh, uh, device. So they get a, a ticket and they think that's discriminatory under the ADA. Unfortunately, the ADA does not say you have to have a sidewalk. It just says where a sidewalk's provided, that sidewalk has to be accessible. So there are a lot of communities in rural and other areas where you don't have pedestrian routes. The ADA, again, does not require a pedestrian route. It only says where it is provided, it must be accessible. Another exception is if there's um, if the circular path um, uh, is interior, then the accessible route must be interior. We often hear from entities who um, have got an existing building that they're renovating. And let's say it's one of those buildings where you go in um, uh, to the main entrance and then you get to a place where you either go up or you go down and they um, they're renovating it and they're saying, hey, well, we'll make another entrance on the outside for somebody to go into the bottom of the, um, the, the basement of the building. That would not meet the ADA accessible route criteria. Um, I need to be able to use the same um, features of accessible route as people with dis without disabilities. So if people without disabilities can get to someplace interiorly, you can't send me exteriorly, especially in when you've got areas that have snow and ice and things of that nature, that would be discriminatory to provide me a separate exterior route 
um, if everybody else can use an interior route, that would be um, discriminatory. Mezzanines um, are not required um, where an elevator is not required. So if I have a mezzanine and I am a private entity and I am less than three stories, um, I'm not required to provide vertical access. However, if I am a Title II entity and I have a, me a, a mezzanine that's going to be considered a second story and I would be looking at what is happening on that sec on that mezzanine as well as far as program access, I'm going to be required to look at vertical access. For work areas, employee work areas, the rule of thumb is approach, entry, and exit. I don't actually have to make the work area itself accessible. That falls under Title I of the ADA for reasonable accommodation. So I would have to make an individual employee's work area accessible, but I must make that area accessible to be able to approach, enter, and exit. So this allows somebody who's a supervisor or who needs to go and visit or, or meet with another staff member to at least be able to get into that office area and back out again from that office area. But my individual work area would not be required to be accessible unless I needed it as a reasonable accommodation. I also need to provide uh, circulation paths in areas that are greater than 1,000 square feet. So we look at things like cubicles, um, areas and things of that nature. Um, so I need to make sure that I have an accessible path of travel. I need to make sure that there's a mean of means of egress. Again, this is a safety issue. And I have to make sure that there is a visual alarm connection, which means that I have to make sure that if there is a visual alarm system, again, the ADA does not require visual alarms. It just says where visual alarms are, where alarm systems are provided, they must be both visual and auditory. So I have to make sure that if an individual office um, it, and you have um, uh, uh, an emergency alarm system that I must also have a visual alarm system in there. That's not a reasonable accommodation issue. That would be a new construction issue um, that I would need to make sure that that Dale, because um, uh, it could change at any time and those are hardwired and you wouldn't want to be um, uh, putting that in as an after fact situation. Again, just give you an idea of what you know means we're talking about exterior, a compliant door, um, that means uh, 32 inch minimum width. The hardware needs to be operated with a closed fist. It has to have no greater than five pounds of force to open or close. Um, and there needs to be clear face in front and within so I can turn around and come back out. Again, this is the uh, cubicle um, that I was talking about looking at um, the uh, making sure there's an accessible path of travel um, and uh, making sure that it is um, uh, designed so that it's accessible for people with disabilities. The individual cubicle itself would be a reasonable accommodation issue for somebody. Toilet rooms are a huge issue under the ADA. There are some exceptions for toilet rooms. When you have a cluster of toilet rooms, that means that you have multiple um, single user toilets. So let's say um, we're seeing more and more of this being constructed where you've got, instead of a um, toilet stalls, a, uh, a women's room with, uh, or a men's room with toilet stalls, you see individual user single user toilets. In that situation, 50% of those single user toilets that are in one location and serve the same users, i.e all women, all um, uh, um, men, they would have to be accessible. And this is a change from 1991, because in 1991, it required all of them to be accessible. So this is actually reducing the accessibility a bit, but it's um, uh, really was a compromise to um, say that, you know, when you have cluster, at least some of them, and get in this case, 50%. So if I have two single user toilets um, that are, you know, uh, unisex toilets, then 50% would have to be accessible. If I have two single use toilets that are uh, all women, then they would also be um, 50% um, or one of those would have to be accessible. Again, this is just an example, like in a medical suite where you'd have clustered toilets, um, where we often see this kind of a thing, they, only 50% would have to be accessible, not all of them. Again, toilet rooms, the ADA um, 2010 standards modified um, in the two, 1991 standards, there was an absolute, you had to be 18 inches to the center line um, from the wall um, of the toilet. And this was because of the reach range for people with disabilities sitting on the toilet, not having to reach too far to get to the grab bar. In the, 19, in the 2010 standards, the um, access board modified that and gave a range between 16 inches and 18 inches of the um, center line. But they do reinforce the fact that a lab Laboratory. That is a sink um, for what most people, but under the um, building code language is a lavatory. A sink is what's in a kitchen. A lavatory is what's in a bathroom. Um, a lavatory cannot overlap the toilet clearance. Uh, the only place that can be happen is in a dwelling unit. 
um, like a dormitory um, or a uh, apartment or a condo or something like that. Must allow for space for side transfers. That's the reason for the clearance um, at the side of the toilet. Individuals may um, pull up to the toilet um, at an angle or they may come uh, clear on the side depending on their need for transferring. Again, this is a requirement for um, uh, clearance. Um, fixtures can be recessed, how half, uh, however, um, the, and then you would, you would use a shorter um, grab bar. Again, allow it to be recessed because you're outside of that um, clear floor space. The door swing um, must be outside of the fixture clearances. So you um, must make sure that somebody um, uh, would be able to open the door and be outside of uh, the fixture clearances. Again, this is for maneuverability purposes. So as the door is opening, I'm not bumping into one of the um, fixtures. Again, the door can swing into fixture if the um, clear floor space is large enough. Um, 30 by 48 um, inches is, is provided outside of the swing. So in, in a larger um, uh, toilet room, so when my toilet room is only 60 by 60, I'm not going to be able to do that because I'm not going to have sufficient clearance. But if I have a larger toilet room, I may still, I may be able to overlap my um, uh, door swing with the clearances if I still have that 30 by 48 um, available outside of the swing of the toilet. Again, a larger toilet room. Dwelling units do apply to state and local government housing and public accommodation um, housing in limited situation. Um, the uh, residential dwelling units um, that apply to state and local government, things like dormitories at a university, um, housing that's owned and operated by the state or local government, like a housing authority um, type of a thing. Uh, all housing, residential housing is also covered if it's three or more um, units is covered under the Fair Housing Act, which uh, Amendments Act, which was actually passed in 1988. So it's really important that you're looking at both of those requirements when you're looking at um, dwelling units and factoring out who and what applies exactly um, to those kinds of situations. So for residential dwelling units, 5% uh, of those units must be wheelchair accessible and 2% must be communication access features. These are not the same. That doesn't mean you do 5% accessible and then 2% of the 5% are gonna be a, a communication accessible. That's in addition. So you'd have 5% accessible that are wheelchair accessible and additional 2% that are communication access. You do not use two for one in that situation. And again, also recognizing that you're covered by HUD's 504 regulations if you're receiving federal funds. Um, uh, and uh, the only exception for residential dwelling units is for facilities with 15 or fewer um, units. So a, um, uh, a uh, um, oh, what do I wanna say? Uh, something that's a, um, a bed and breakfast or something like that. Um, I'm going to make the difference between a residential facility and a transient lodging facility. A residential is for long term in nature and is used as a residence. This would include um, uh, dormitories and things of that nature, even though they're nine months or they're only for a semester, they're considered to be long term. They're not considered to be transient. Transient is short term in nature, not used as a residence. Um, so that is where like things like um, Airbnbs and uh, Verbos and um, uh, hotels and motels uh, fit into those kinds of things. Um, uh, often your um, uh, um, like a, um, oh, I'm trying, I'm, I'm going to go on because I can't think of it. But anyway, um, you hopefully you get the, the sense of what I'm talking about there. So communication access includes alarms. This would be any kind of alarm. This could be a CO2 alarm. This could be a fire alarm. Um, they are required to be both auditory and visual. Um, signage is covered under the ADA. Telephones and TTYs are covered. Assisted lifting systems are covered. Um, ATMs are covered and two-way communication systems are covered under the ADA. Um, all of these things um, fit and, and have different types of requirements. Um, signs are required to have raised characters. They're required to have Braille. And if they have visual characters, they're, um, they're not required to have visual characters, but if they do, um, they, um, uh, it st states how they should be used. Um, and then pictograms. So when we talk about signs, we're talking about signs that are, in, are uh, defined as used for those that um, define permanent, rooms and spaces. 
So a exit, a um, uh, area of rescue assistance, a room with a number on it, a restroom, men's room, women's room, uh, single user restroom, all gender restroom, whatever. Those would all be required to have um, raised characters, braille um, on them. A sign that is um, only used for um, uh, the boardroom or for um, the library or whatever, that sign would not be required to have raised characters and braille because it's not a designated a permanent room and space. But let's say it was the library room 330. The library sign would not have to, let's say it's the, you know, um, uh, you know, John F. Kennedy Library and room 310. The library, John F. Kennedy Library would not have to be in braille or raised characters, but the room number 310 would have to be braille and raised characters because that is always going to be room. Rooms are considered to be permanently assigned designations. And so it would always be room 10. It might change and become conference room later on versus library. And so that's not required to be um, uh, raised character and braille. But that's an important um, uh, piece to understand when it comes to signage. because There's a lot of confusion often about that and what's required when it comes to signage. Again, um, visual directional signages or informational signs are not required um, to be in tactile and raised. The only um, exemptions are temporary signs, building um, uh, menus, address company names and log uh, logos and things like that. They are, uh, are exempted. They're not required to have any of those um, meet any of the requirements. The directional and informational signs are required to meet the visual requirements, for, which is for character height and for um, contrast. And so people often get questions about contrast and contrast is like white on black, black on white. Sometimes what we see a lot of entities do is they try to make their signage fancy and they use different colors or gradations of color. And the issue is to make sure that there is a stark um, contrast in color. The ADA doesn't actually define what colors to be used or not used. It just says that you have to have um, sufficient um, uh, contrast. Telephones, if you have public phones, and we really don't see public phones anymore um, because of cell phones and things of that nature, but although I have seen a few lately um, in some airports that I've been traveling in, I was surprised to see. Um, but if there is a public phone, it has to have a volume control. It has to have a re an automatic reset um, for uh, the decibel uh, um, limitation. That's for people who use hearing aids or are hard of hearing. The ADA uh, requires TTYs um, if they uh, are installed. And in, if you have a public telephone, you have to also have a public TTY. And it gives minimum requirements for the height of the keyboard and things of that nature um, uh, under the ADA. We are not seeing um, a lot of uh, uh, public phones, as I said, so we don't see public TTYs um, necessarily. But if you do have them, um, they are required to meet the requirements. And they revise the scoping slightly. Um, uh, under the uh, 2010 for the number of um, uh, phones that would be required to have TTY um, if they were in a bank of phones. Assistive listening systems are required um, uh, in situations uh, such as um, uh, um, uh, oh, when you have a, a, a large uh, large meeting room or anything. That, so that used to be that it was only required where you had fixed seating. Now it's required where you have amplification. Um, so you could have a room that doesn't have fixed seating, um, but you have amplification in that room. So if you have amplification in that room, what I mean is you have a built-in amplify, you know, uh, audio system or whatever, you're going to have to have assistive listening systems available. And there's been some changes um, uh, in the 2010 ADA standards that provides more specificity about the type and the um, uh, level of, of chirping and things of that nature. So more specificity about the uh, quality of those assistive listening systems. So this is different than what is Previously, in 1991, you only had to have them where there was fixed seating. Um, in the 2010, it's only now triggered by where um, uh, amplification is provided. So again, we have a lot of rooms that have amplification in them, but they don't have fixed seating because we want flexibility to move them around as a conference room or to move them around as a meeting room or whatever. They're going to be required if you have amplification to have assistive listening systems built in.
ATMs and fare machines are covered under um, the 2010 ADA standards. Access to one of each type at each location is required, and they're required to have speech output, uh, a means of privacy, um, input controls um, that are accessible, um, a, a display screen, and Braille instructions for how to uh, enable the speech mode. So they're not required to have um, uh, headphones, but they're required to have a headphone jack so that somebody has their own headphone, they can plug it in to hear the speech for privacy purposes. Um, then you'll see, uh, if you can look closely on my on the vision, view of the um, ATM I have here, which is a financial ATM, you'll see that it's got um, Braille um, and tactile uh, signage on it. Uh, you probably can't see it very well, but to the right of the keyboard, you'll see that there's Braille information and that's giving them information. Because of course, for somebody who uses a, uh, who's blind, um, that, that touch screen is meaningless to them. They don't know what those buttons are. They don't know where to touch on the screen and such. There, so there has to be a way to do it through um, keyboard as well as through um, uh, the uh, buttons. Where we have two-way communication systems, they have to be both audible and visual signal. So this would be in a emergency, like in an elevator situation, they have to be both audible and visible. Like if there's a problem on the elevator, areas of rescue assistance are required to have um, this as well, two-way communication. Anywhere that you have two-way um, communication, this also could be at an entry of a building where you have to be buzzed in. Um, you have to have both audible and visual signals to let somebody know um, that it has been answered um, and um, uh, what to do um, in regards to that. Just briefly going to cover the swimming pools. There's a means of egress required depending on how big the, pool, the pool is. So depending on how large it is, it may have to have one more than one way to get in. Um, so uh, that could be either a lift or a sloped entry so that somebody could wheel in or walk in if they had um, mobility, uh, disability use a crutch cane or something of that nature. Um, a sloped entry, you know, it, it is gradual um, so that it is uh, um, lets you get into the water gradually and must have um, uh, railings as well for somebody to walk into. Again, this just shows, um, you know, uh, some people will use their own wheelchair. However, most people don't want to use their wheelchair because they don't want to get it damaged by water. Um, from a program accessibility perspective, entities need to look at um, providing some type of device. This one on the right is a wheelchair uh, water type wheelchair that can be used and go, gone into the water. So these are kind of program access issues as you would look at your self-evaluation and transition plan, which I'll be talking about tomorrow. These are some of the things that would be explored if I had a recreation program. Just a more, to just give you an idea of what a sloped entry looks like. Pool lift um, uh, needs to be uh, provided where water does not exceed 48 inches in depth. Um, must have a footrest um, and must be able, the foot must, must move with the seat so that my body moves at the same time as the seat moves. Also must have independent operation. It must have an armrest um, so that somebody, again, um, would be able to rest their arms uh, getting in and out of the pool on the lift and independent operation. So it's not enough to say, well, we have a staff member who will operate that for you. I also can have a transfer wall, which allows somebody to um, uh, transfer up and down from the water uh, for, through a series of steps. This is what one might look like. And again, um, you know, here's an, a, a much deeper pool where you would allow somebody to be able to uh, exit the pool and then be able to get onto their wheelchair. So what's above and outside the pool is used and has a, at a height so somebody could transfer onto their um, wheelchair. Uh, pool stairs um, must comply with the stairs requirements uh, for certain heights. Um, however, the difference is they're not required to have an extension at the bottom, only at the top, because that would interfere with other swimmers um, at the bottom. Could be a danger issue. Uh, spas like a, um, a, a whirlpool also are covered and are required to have a, um, a lift as well. Waiting pools must have a sloped entry. Handrails are not required on a waiting pool. So some areas that are still under development that we don't yet have um, uh, standards for under the ADA, um, and they're progressing. So if you're not familiar with um, the uh, ADA standards setting process, um, the U.S. Access Board is a standard setting agency that is defined under the ADA or is charged with doing this under the ADA. They develop the standards, but the U.S. Department of Justice is the agency that is responsible for creating the enforcement 
enforceable standard under the ADA. So the um, Access Board creates the uh, guideline, um, goes through all the research, um, creates what is, uh, you know, works through all the process of uh, conciliation with all of the interest groups of interest and stuff. But then that's there's works done at that point. Um, then it's up to the U.S. Access Board to go through and decide who does it apply to, how does it apply, what are what's the um, consequence of not um, complying, and um, you know adopting it as part of Title II or Title III of the ADA and stipulating you know um, is it only state and local government, is it uh, is it both state and local government, you know, and um, uh, uh, private entities, et cetera. So with um, a lot of activity occurred during the Obama administration by the U.S. Access Board, they were, um, during that eight years, were engaged in a huge amount of um, st standard setting. They were developing a lot of um, areas of uh, guidance for accessibility under the ADA. Because when the ADA was passed in 1990, and then the standards came, came out in 91, it was recognized that there were a lot of things that were not included. Um, and and there, there's still more work to be done. Then with the 2010 ADA standards, that gave us a chance to kind of play catch up, which we did by um, incorporating the play areas and incorporating recreation facilities and things of that nature. But now we've had this huge void from 2010 and we're now new into 2022. And we have this um, enormous need for um, more standards to be enforceable under the ADA because there's a lot of areas that we still don't have enforcement for. And those include outdoor developed areas, which include things like um, campgrounds, trails, and stuff like that. Um, passenger vessels, uh, which includes things like um, being able to get on and off of a um, cruise ship, being able to get on and off of a, a boat. If you go up to the Mackinac Island in Michigan or um, ferries that you might have um, on the river, um, you know, in Cleveland or down in Cincinnati, you've got um, some, uh, you know, uh, ferries and things that are open to the public. Uh, still some issues with transportation vehicles, especially around lifts and different kinds of lifts. As wheelchairs have changed, um, you know, uh, lifts and things have had to change. We, you know, um, with technology, wheelchairs have become more sophisticated um, and, and there's different kinds of wheelchairs uh, and stuff being used. And the original um, specifications for vehicle lifts had certain pound uh, weight limits and certain size requirements limits. Um, and we're finding that those don't really always meet um, some of the emerging technologies. And so this issue has been revisited and needs to continue to be revisited. Some of you may most recently, um, even though this is not ADA, it's just a little side note, have seen some uh, articles in the newspaper about the fact that the FAA um, is Federal Aviation Administration, I'm sorry, by using acronyms, um, is exploring um, the requirements for the airlines to uh, incorporate where people would actually be able to travel um, on the airplane in their own wheelchair versus having to transfer out of um, their wheelchair. And that's something that the FAA is looking to incorporate into new regulations for um, air, um, airline um, uh, air, airplanes. So similar with uh, the uh, ADA is having to look at those things um, in regards to uh, uh, keeping up with technology and newer devices for ADA, transportation, buses, trains, et cetera. Information and telecommunication technology, we still do not have um, uh, standards for the internet. Uh, emergency transportable housing, um, FEMA has adopted some um, regulations for emergency transportable housing, and that's what we refer people to at this time, but that's at the federal level. But we often have emergency transportable housing being purchased at the local level um, by um, local municipalities and things when let's say there's been a fire or there's been a disaster of some type and people can't live or can't return to their um, community right away until it's the oil spill has been cleaned up or the gas leak or whatever it might be, um, and they bring in emergency transportable housing. Well, what about people and families with disabilities? You know, that um, needs to be finalized. Medical diagnostic equipment is a huge issue. This is your mammogram, your exam tables, your um, MRIs, things of that nature. Um, the, uh, we don't have standards for those for do, to be accessible. So it's very hard for people to find um, this accessible equipment. And we know and, and history shows that people with disabilities are under um, addressed medically because of this issue. They don't get um, the same quality of medical care because there's a lack of equipment to serve their needs because of their disability. Shared use paths. Um, more and more as we become, uh, maybe, I don't know, healthier society, I, debatable sometimes, where we're starting to use paths where we're, you know, pedestrian, bikes, bikes, 
you know, um, and segues, you know, uh, and whatever. Um, so how does that look? And how do those look from an accessibility perspective? How do we uh, delineate those? How do we make sure that people with disabilities are safe um, and that people without disabilities are safe using um, in those shared path situations? And then classroom acoustics. Um, this is an issue in classrooms for people who deaf, hard of hearing. Uh, this has been a long-standing issue we still have not resolved. But again, there are, all of these things have guidelines that have been created for them. They just have not yet been adopted by the Department of Justice as enforceable standards. So for example, the public rights of way, the uh, federal government has adopted the ADA's federal rights of way um, for federal highway administration. So if I am a um, state or I am a local municipality and I get federal highway dollars and I am doing a project that is using federal highway dollars, I am actually having to follow the ADA's um, public rights of way um, guidelines that were passed by the, um, the uh, US Access Board because the Department of Transportation has adopted them as enforceable under the federal law. They're still not enforceable under the ADA. Um, so, it, you know, that, that, um, but because federal dollars are involved, I get to um, make that argument. We would say to the, um, let's say the Ohio Department of Transportation that, you know, you should be um, looking to the public rights of way requirements under the ADA for all of your projects, irregardless of whether or not federal dollars are being used because it's best practice. You know, just as if you are doing emergency transportable housing and your department, your Ohio, you know, emergency management agency is purchasing emergency transportable housing just because there's an absence of a standard for that enforceable under the ADA. We know that there are guidelines for this. We know best practice and you should be doing it. Um, you know, just as your um, medical uh, facilities that are at the state level that own or operate your state, your university hospitals, things of that nature, you should be following the medical diagnostic equipment standard uh, guidelines for accessibility and purchasing that equipment that's accessible because that's best practice. We, we know that these things are required to be accessible. They need to be accessible for people with disabilities. You can't hide behind the fact that, well, we don't know what it looks like. We don't know what's required. Yes, you do. It's just that it's not enforceable. So again, I'm telling you and I'm pleading with you, imploring with you to look to go beyond the minimum requirements of the ADA and look to what's out there and what's available as you are planning new and as you are remodeling and renovating to make sure you're incorporating and including these things um, in that plans and in those discussions. So at this time, I am um, open to taking any questions uh, that I can um, or that are um, posed by the audience. Any questions? I know I went through really fast, short period of time. I could spend hours talking and drilling down into each element in the 2010 standards, but I didn't have time. Anything? Silence? Well, I do we, want to say yeah. that was extremely insightful. Um, and I think you laid out really well. I really like the way you laid out. It doesn't tell us what to do, but if you have certain things, it provides a standard if you have those things. So we'll make sure that we um, collect your information as well and use it as part of our learning uh, for Ohio. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks. Well, I know, I mean, I do have to applaud your Ohio building um, uh, uh, folks because they do do a good job um at your state level of um enforcing your ohio code and we refer you know people to them all the time um you know to make sure that they are you know following the ohio code and you know um ohio has um you know worked i think hard to make sure that you do have it incorporated into your uh state code which then trickles down to the local code because remember that the ada um not being a, a building code is not enforceable at the local level um, so a local building code inspector has no obligation to um, to uh, um, in, uh, investigate for um, ADA compliance or to um, you know certify for ADA compliance when they're looking at a, a new building or a, a renovation or a building permit or anything. They're only required to cover um, the state of Ohio um, uh, code and, or, or any local code if they have um, local control. And so, you know, um, it is important that people really um, understand that your Ohio code is as important as the ADA is. And um, it, it, it is a, uh, you know, pretty much a mirror um, of what the ADA requires. So, but it, you know, it's a, it's a building code. And uh, again, it doesn't have the same uh, um, uh, uh, civil rights implications that the ADA does. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody, and um, have a good rest of your day.
Thank you, Rob, and thank you, everyone, for attending. We hope you enjoyed the session. Um, if you do have additional questions that you uh, didn't bring up or come up later, please, uh, or you'd like to request the presentation materials, please make sure you email the Office of Disability Inclusion at ODI, um, ODI at das.ohio.gov. And we'd like to invite you also to uh, share your feedback on the link provided in the Q&A. And uh, we appreciate you and Robin and everyone supporting Ohio's commitment to disability inclusion. And please enjoy the rest of your day. Have a good one, everybody. Take care.